The time has finally come to document one. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodyte's Guitar Show. So there's a version of a Les Paul Custom that I've wanted to document on the show since its inception, but I've been waiting for the most clean one, and I wasn't willing to make any exceptions until this one. And it's all because it had one of these. It's the most ridiculously overpriced original Gibson case that you could buy. The Artist series. And finding one with the handle still attached is a very rare sight. So these are kind of cool cases in that aspect, but here is the version I've been waiting for. A beautiful maple fretboard Les Paul Custom. But unfortunately, this is not the one I'm looking for due to one mistake 40 plus years ago. Can you guys see what's wrong with this one somebody wanted it to be a synthesizer and put one of those midi pickups on it drill directly into the top in both locations ah <laughs> i had to pick it up because there's a part of me that's like you know what who cares i could have somebody put some maple dowels in there and you know try to touch it up a little bit or make it an accent piece like put little ebony pieces or mother of pearl and it's just part of the story of this one at this point of the review i'm not exactly sure what i'm going to do but i knew i had to pick this up because a the really rare case and b it appears to be in pretty good shape so if you're looking at this and they're like huh Maple fretboard Les Paul Custom, what is the history on that? Around late 1974 into 75, Gibson starts to transition into the maple neck. If you learn nothing else from this video, this is your neck. This is your fretboard. So when referring to a guitar with a maple fretboard, don't mistakenly call it a maple neck because it's not always a maple neck, but in this case, it happens to be all maple. But anyways, around that time period when Gibson starts to transition into the three-piece maple necks, they also started to offer the option of a straight up maple fretboard. You don't find it too often in the late 74 into 75, but around 1976 throughout the late 70s, you do find them a little bit more often. They start to taper off around 1980, 81. Then there's like a brief resurgence of them around 85, 86. But after that point, you really don't see them come back until about 2011 as we enter into the rich light era when ebony became hard for Gibson to use. A lot of dealers were like, huh. Our customers don't like this man-made material. They want real wood. Why don't we try rosewood? And then other dealers had the idea of let's go maple again. Now the big difference between those and the vintage originals is the modern ones do not have a lacquered fretboard. And the naked maple gets stained with your hands, dirt, and oil over time, which is personally why I've always preferred the vintage ones. Now as to why they started to use maple fretboards back in the 70s, I would assume it has something to do with Fender and other brands using maple fretboards so they figure, eh, why don't we offer the option? Maybe we could convert a player or two. I wouldn't necessarily call them rare, but they are uncommon. They have their own select buyer pool, because most people, when they think Les Paul Custom, they want the traditional ebony. And you typically find these in two main colors. There's the ebony finished, and then the one we're documenting today. The natural finish, oftentimes referred to by fans as the blonde beauty, for obvious reasons. The black beauty, it's ebony custom. The blonde one, it's the exact opposite. So what's additionally cool about this one is the fact that we have the six digit serial number. So this is probably a late 74, 75, one of the earlier ones. So now you can imagine just how disappointed I am. Somebody had to put a MIDI system on it because the large tortoiseshell side markers tell me this was a Kalamazoo built one. However, it's after the point that they switched over to the Nashville style bridge. But the story behind this is it was listed on Reverb by a shop that looks like they might have took it in on consignment or they had just recently purchased it from the original owner. Apparently it hasn't been played too much. I mean, look at all the dust dirt and grime just on the outside of the case. The frets have a lot of green grime and stuff on it. Honestly, I thought it'd be in worse shape than it is. It's got that interesting aging to the gold on that neck pickup, a little bit green. But they had called it a 77 custom, but apparently that guy bought it in 1977 and that's why they listed it as such. And it was one of those times where the price was pretty good. Even though they have offers on the listing, if you make an offer and wait for them to get back to you, you're probably gonna miss out on the guitar. So after weighing my options, it's like, yeah, I need to do this. Even if this doesn't end up working out for my collection, I'm always buying artist series cases when they're not like ridiculously expensive. And this one that's got some wear, like our ribbon has come unglued slash stapled, but hey, at least it's still there. But being an early example, let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench, get it cleaned up and see if we can find any secrets hiding in its cavities.
It's safe to say this one cleaned up beautifully. So I made the decision just to dowel the holes right now. That way they're not exposed and pulling in moisture. Could somebody do something better later on? Sure, but at least it looks a little bit better now. As far as the neck pickup, the green was able to clean off. I'm not quite sure what it was. Pretty sure it was eating the gold hardware. So that's how we have this very interesting wear pattern to it, but it's all shiny again. It does have an error correct T-top. But you'll notice this is the slightly older version that has the slotted screws still. And then right here, there is a date stamp. So the date stamping starts in 1975. And the earlier ones do have it in the corner before they move it towards the middle. But our bridge pickup's looking fantastic. Just some light wear. I did notice that the pickup ring is cracked right here. Thankfully, it still works. This date code we actually can read. It looks like it says January 24th, 1977. So this is actually towards the end of them doing the whole postage stamp thing down here before they move it to the bigger font and everything. These pickups within the circuit read pretty nice. 7.49 in the bridge, 7.5 in the neck, and the middle just for fun. 3.78. Check out the pickup cavities. It's just kind of strange seeing the really, really dark, rich mahogany wood as compared to all this maple everywhere else. I didn't really see any pertinent markings in here that would tell us any more about the history, but it's cool to see anyway. The maple top joining onto that mahogany body. Now onto our bridge and tailpiece, regular Nashville style. You gotta remember when this guitar came out, this was a fairly new bridge known as the Nashville Bridge because they started to use it when the Nashville plant opened. They were made in Germany by Schaller. Unfortunately, the bridge has collapsed, so there's probably going to be some buzzing in the middle registers, but it's original. It is what it is. The reason that happens is the neck angle dictates that the bridge needs to be about right here, which is pretty high up, but the owner has the tailpiece decked because they want the sustain, and then the pressure on the bridge collapses it over time. So if you want it decked and your bridge has to be like this for action reasons, that's why you want a top wrap. And we've got the full weight tailpiece, which is nice and shiny again. As far as the condition on the top, you've got some light chipping around the binding. That's pretty common. It's just a build up of finish. Underneath your pick guard, you have the typical bracket ding. There's like a small finish crack running between the bridge post and where they installed that. Not a big deal, but it is there. Yeah, maybe a small ding right there outside of our four filled in screw holes. The top, besides the MIDI installation, is actually insanely clean and it hasn't aged too much. Like it has a little bit of a yellowed hue. It definitely started life a little bit more pale, but you can see some shadows where the tailpiece and bridge were, as well as the pit guard. And it nearly suggests that there might have been some fading happening to the outside of the guitar. So maybe it even started life a little bit yellow. But sometimes the off-gassing of the plastics and other things can also change the finish under there, so it's not necessarily what happened. But even if you take your pick guard off, you still have a pick guard on it. But this is within the Norlin era of Gibson, so you've got a three-piece top that's common. You've got some interesting wood grain, although nothing too crazy. But some nicer ones over on this piece. But I thought I would reach out to the shop and see if they had any additional stories about the original owner. Because I was suspicious of these knobs. And thankfully, they responded. So the story behind this one is Jim, the original owner, got it as he graduated college in 1977 and the shop had ordered this guitar in for him. Originally, this guitar likely would have had the reflector style knobs because 75, 76, that's when you're transitioning out of the witch hats into the black reflectors. And then in 78, you transition into the black speed knobs. But he wanted these cool gold ones because obvious reasons it matches. So he kept this guitar with him throughout his career in Northern Virginia in the web development industry and he recently sold it just because he's more into acoustics at this time. And he decided to put that very early Roland MIDI system on it very early on because it was the new hip thing to do. It eventually came off and he regretted his decision. So this thing was never his primary player but it's cool that one of these survived in this condition minus the screw holes. So I would imagine these will actually still glow, but now we do know the true story. They're not the true original knobs, but they've been on the guitar longer than the originals ever were. But I did notice there's like some finish checking right there. Something either dinged this or they were trying to install the knobs and they were hammering it. But you can definitely see some finish checking in that area. And if you take this knob off, the whole shaft of that pot is recessed into it. Maybe they were some wild men trying to install the new knobs. Here's a look at the pick guard. It's got some picking wear. Gold bracket cleaned up nicely. And then here's the backside. It had all the caked on dust and everything that's been cleaned. 
This is built within the pancake era of Gibson. This is like one of the last years that you get this middle layer. You've got a slab of mahogany, thin stripe of maple, and then another mahogany to make up your body. However, most people don't realize this. There's another small slab of maple in between your maple top and the mahogany body as well. This one continues on way longer. Around 77 is when this visible one starts to transition away. Check out our frets now. <laughs> no more oxidation on those puppies. And the great thing about it being a maple fretboard with lacquer is you can just clean the whole fretboard. So it's going to be a little bit more smoother to play now too. It definitely has a little bit of fret wear, but nothing too crazy. To find one of these without the fingernail wear and the finish being worn off, is such a hard task and that's what I wanted to document because when you watch my show you want to see an original example in as clean a shape as possible that way if you're trying to verify yours or you're curious what it looked like brand new it's a good reference that's why I like to collect the clean ones now, unfortunately wood and inlays move at different rates so it is very common to see like some small chipping around your inlays or at least some lacquer shrinking this one's not perfect However, a lot of times the lacquer just straight up chips off these inlays. And this one, at least for the most part, it's covered with the original lacquer yet. I was kind of shocked to see that the nut is also coated over in the lacquer. That's a little silly, but you'll notice this is a bone nut. So this is kind of an interesting transitional piece. So it's Kalamazoo made. They kept the bone nuts a little bit longer, but you'll notice we have a short neck tenon in here. So if this was a transitional neck tenon, that would probably put us towards 75, but our pickups are dating to 77. We've got that Nashville bridge, so that probably puts us towards the later. But you also have to remember, we have the then new Schaller Gibson branded tuners. We'll talk about those a little bit more later, but usually, you know, earliest of 75 when they start to bring this in. I thought for sure this was gonna be a late 75 to 76. Wait till you see the pot codes. But let's grab our neck specs before we get too far into that. Nut measures 1.7, increases to 2.06 inches. First fret neck depth 0.83, increasing to 0.97 by the 12th. Here's a look at that neck profile. First fret, 12th fret. It's definitely a C-shaped neck, but yeah, it definitely does chunk up as you get up there. Although it still feels slim, which we've got some interesting finish checking along the edge of the binding. You don't normally see that. Typically it's just at the edge of the frets, but this one's got some additional. Look how clean this headstock is. That's ridiculous. Kind of reminds me of my 1974 two-piece quilt top version. It had a really clean headstock like this as well. It's not perfect though. You do have some string change scratches like right here by that tuner and another scratch down there, but overall really clean shape. Here's a look at your truss rod cover. This is another way that we can tell the era that the guitar is from because around 76, they transition into that more modern looking one that has the wider bevel. So this one's definitely one of those older parts because it's got more of a predominant black layer. So now the backside, where things get very interesting. Looks like the original owner might have played Schwapper Rooney with our pickups, because those do not look like original solder joints. Looks like they might have used the original ones, but that just doesn't look right to me. But sure enough, the pots date to the 46th week of 1976 on all four of them. Now some other modifications have taken place because we no longer have the shielding tin. And you can tell somebody added a traditional ground wire at some point. They ran it through your pickup cavity and soldered them together. Well, let's come up to the headstock and do a little history lesson in here. So this six digit style serial number, it transitions away in late 75. That's the intro of the decal era. 99 nine means 1975. 00, 1976, 06, early 1977, before we get the introduction of the now year, day, 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 year production number sequence. So this neck had to have been made at the latest of 1975. So it's possible this was just like an older neck that Kalamazoo had for some reason, and they used it up on this one. Everything else, electronics wise, definitely points to, you know, built in late 76, or maybe they just ran out of decals one day or something. I don't know. I mean, technically, I, I think they were very accurate. I would call this a late 76, early 1977, <laughs> despite some other things not looking exactly like that. Because look, the pots and pickups they match. Here's a look at our toggle switch cavity. I think I need to clean that out. It's got too much dust. But the back is not 100% perfect. We've got the cool yellow grain fill. It's just something you have to like in this era. But if you get it in the light, you can see he had a belt buckle, something kind of scratched into the surface. You can't get those out. But thankfully, they're not usually apparent. But we definitely know he had this out on a stand, and that makes sense. This thing was kind of crusty feeling. I got that all off. But it's just dust settling on it. But you've got pretty nasty stand rash there. 
You can see it right here now that I've pointed it out. I mean, thankfully, the natural finish hides it pretty well, but if you know to look for it, it's there. Same thing on the neck. You've got a splotch right there. Otherwise, a beautiful three-piece maple neck. It actually has a little bit of flame figuring within it. Not enough to say, yeah, this is a flamed neck, but it definitely came to life after a polish. There's our sweet Gibson branded Schaller tuners. These things are awesome. They stand the test of time and they look cool. Previous to these, Gibson was using the Klusen Waffleback tuners, which are cool, but do not stand the test of time. There's our serial number. Now you might say, hey, I thought you said this was Kalamazoo. What's with the Made in USA in that direction? They didn't have to switch it from horizontal to vertical until Nashville made. So that's also why I think this might be a slightly later neck. But sometimes the Kalamazoo guys are in a funny goofy mood and they do that even past that, usually for special examples. Now thankfully, I don't actually see any stand rash on the edges of the headstock though. Those are the ones that usually bug me the most. Or if the stand wraps over and slightly discolors the finish right here, but thankfully we do not have that on this one. On to that blacklight test. Everything's looking good at the top. Obviously you can see the filled in holes a little bit easier here, in case you somehow missed it before. Looks like we've got some finish checking in this area. Here you can see the finish area I was talking about earlier. There's another finish check right there. But there you go, proof that those knobs are at least older. And you can kind of see that finish checking better in this lighting. As well as all the areas where it has chipped along the inlays. It becomes very obvious once you hit the blacklight on it. So we'll just take some time to run up here. All things considered, still a very great example. After seeing one this clean, I'm not sure it's possible to actually find a perfect one now that I understand what's going on. But our headstock's looking good. Now the back of the body looks nice, but again you can see the stand rash, in case you didn't see it before. The edges are looking good too. Surprisingly, didn't really see much finish checking along the pancake body or anything. But now the neck, once again, stand rash. Becomes a little bit more obvious. Looks like maybe another even lighter one right there. He must have used a few different stands. A little bit of a clear coat rub, but yeah, that's a nice one. But okay, maybe there is a little bit of a stand rub right here. It just didn't have as much of a reaction. This side's even cleaner though. And how much does this beast weigh? An unsurprising 11 pounds. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. <laughs> to the stereotype that maple sounds brighter, but it does seem to have just a little bit of brightness to it. But as I was expecting, the bridge is collapsed, and that was the reason why it was jacked all the way up to the ceiling and caused it to collapse even further. So I have it where it should be, but unfortunately... I would have to raise the action to make all the notes like 100% ring out or raise the bridge and make the action uncomfortable. So if somebody wanted to gig this, you would want to replace the bridge. But I'm kind of curious. I just so happen to have a different 1977 natural custom. We're going to A-B test these because it's the closest thing I have to the full-on test. Now this one's technically a Nashville built one. This one's Kalamazoo. It, this one has the pancake body, whereas this one doesn't. They also have different nut materials. It's not a one-for-one -one recreation but it's as close as we can get as far as all maple neck versus ebony and maple fretboards and similar pickups. <laughs>
clean tones in the room, it was like, okay, you could go either way. Maybe a little difference, but wow, distorted. <laughs> This one's got some serious sustain, and it's noticeably brighter, I would say. This thing's a little ferocious fire breather. No, I'd never thought the maple fretboard would be good for crazy distortion stuff, but yeah, this particular one anyways is fantastic for that. I guess now we know why Zach Wilde likes maple fretboards on his Les Paul Customs. Now that could just be a placebo effect and this just happens to be a really nice pair of T-tops, but definitely let me know in the comments which one you preferred. This one's about two pounds lighter, so I liked playing that, but once I got to the distorted settings, that's when there was like a clear night and day difference, both good, but maybe these are sleepers. So even though I initially purchased this one just to abscond with his case for one of my The Les Pauls, something about the story of this one and the overall condition of it, regardless of those holes, just kind of speaks to me. So I think I'm just gonna hold on to this one for now and I'm gonna let it keep its case because it's part of the history of this one. But there we go, a maple fretboarded example documented. Does the goop make you play a little bit slower? Yeah, I can see why some guys don't like it, but I think the tones speak for itself. Give one of these things a try if you ever happen to see one of these at a store. All right, Troglodytes, I hope you enjoy your newfound guitar knowledge. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.